All right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, two concepts that I want to introduce into the language we use to talk about blockchain operations, and those are reflection and introspection. And before I talk about uh, those in the context of blockchains, uh, they're about the operation of accessing blockchain data. So let's look, look at first how normal users access blockchain data today. So one of the really interesting properties of execution on blockchain is that all state and all execution is transparent. So obviously this is challenging for privacy, but it does mean that running a program on Ethereum offers the highest level of possible transparency. And the way that users initially will access data on chain, hopefully, is via querying some type of archive node, either one that they run themselves or run one run by some sort of external JSON RPC provider. And I want to take the frame that an archive node is fundamentally used to show historic on-chain data to the human eyeball. OK, so you get a, a piece of data from an archive node, and you see it, but there's some sort of lack of trust there. Like, you are trusting the archive node to actually give you a valid piece of data. You could optionally request some type of light kind proof that the data is correct, but in practice, really very few people do that. Now, if we think about the evolution of user demand for blockchain data, you know, maybe in 2017, you'd be very lucky to even re receive a historic storage slot. Um, as things progress, users demand more. Okay, so you start out with your variety of options for archive notes. You're gonna get more sophisticated by being able to query indexers like Etherscan, the graph, or Covalent for more derived quantities of the data that you get from archive nodes. For example, you might want to realize that certain events correspond to trades on Uniswap and compute the total PL of some trader. And finally, we're now seeing a wave of consumer facing companies that actually do full transaction simulation for hypothetical transactions. So these wallets are able to tell you, hey, if you actually submitted this transaction and it ran against the current blockchain state, then it's going to result in some hacker taking all your money. So maybe don't run this transaction. And the trend we see in user-facing on-chain data access is that the demands get ever more complex and evolve from raw data, derived quantities of data, and then transaction simulation. So now let's turn to looking at the situation for smart contracts. Today, things are quite different. If you navigate to a CryptoPunk profile page on OpenSea, and you look at all of the on-chain data that's displayed on that page, you will, after some time, be a little bit dismayed to realize that there's actually only one number on the page that a smart contract can access. And that number is the address of the current owner of that CryptoPunk. But of course, OpenSea has a good reason for displaying a lot of information on the page. They want to show you much richer quantities, like the transaction history of the CryptoPunk, maybe what it's sold for, what it was listed for. And not all of those are on chain, but many of them are. So unfortunately, all of this rich historic on chain information can't be made available to smart contracts for a fundamental trade-off that Ethereum has to make. Essentially, if smart contracts could access this information, that would force all validating full nodes to keep this information in random access. And that makes it very challenging to run a full node and hurts the decentralization properties of Ethereum or any other blockchain. I don't think you can really get around this constraint. So this problem motivated us at Axiom to build a workaround to this limitation and enable smart contracts to access on-chain data in a similar way to humans. So what we've done is use zero knowledge to enable this operation, which we're calling reflection for smart contracts. The way that works is that the current block of Ethereum, or typically any other blockchain, will commit to all previous blocks. And every previous block commits to the states and transactions in those blocks. So what that means is that if you can access the current block of Ethereum, then actually you have a commitment to the entire history of Ethereum. The problem is that it's very hard for you to 
decommit to, to verifiably prove any historic fact you want to know about. The reason for that is the decommitment would be a huge chain of Ketchak uh, proofs, uh, sorry, of Ketchak of evaluations on historic block headers that lead to the current block header. And then finally, a bunch of Merkle Patricia try proofs which prove the various storage and state and transactions that you care about. So this is computationally infeasible to do in the EVM, but at Axiom, we've developed a way to put all of this decommitment and verification inside a zero-knowledge proof. So in our system, what you do is you fetch the data you want. We'll fetch light client proofs for all of uh, the data accesses that you're looking for, and we prove in ZK that th these provide a valid decommitment up to the root of trust given by a recent block hash. So after that proof is verified on chain, you actually have trustless access to the entire history of the chain from ZK. So that's very theoretical, but what does it mean for you as a developer? Well, the way that you can actually use reflection as a developer is through an operation we're terming ZK coprocessing. What that means is from your smart contract, you can first trustlessly read historic on-chain data via the proofs that I just discussed. In the second step, we now give you access to a potentially huge amount of data, which maybe exceeds what you can process in the EVM. So we also give you access to verified compute primitives on top of this data. These could be analytics operations, uh, cryptography operations, or even machine learning operations, really whatever you want. At the end, you have some result, which is a small number of data points that you actually want to store in your smart contract. We can deliver that to you by verifying the proof that all of those numbers were validly computed on chain, and then use that in your downstream application. So let's look at some of the trade-offs between using this ZK-based reflection and traditional smart contract access. So if you just use a vanilla smart contract, you get the, one of the most valuable properties, which is synchronous access to the current on-chain state. That's something which fundamentally requires consensus. And as you can see on the slide, ZK does not enable to you to access the current state because it's fundamentally synchronous. On the other hand, to preserve decentralization, smart contracts have no access at all to historic accounts, states, transactions, or receipts. And with ZK, we're able to give asynchronous access to all of that information. So in this way, ZK provides a trade-off between synchronous and asynchronous while enabling you to access a vastly larger set of information. Okay, so let's talk about why you would even want to do this. Um, I chose an image of a baby chicken because I think we're still taking our baby steps in making use of reflection. So a few of the initial applications that we've seen at Axiom are first to remove trust from a large set of oracles that are currently used on-chain today. This could be for simple quantities like the historic price or volatility, or maybe historic gas price. If you make the oracle sufficiently complemented, uh, com complicated, we actually think that it changes in nature a little bit the application. One common pattern we're seeing is that protocols are now able to do trustless accounting. What that means is that the participants in the protocol have some on-chain record of their performance, and the protocol is able to do trustless payout or slashing depending on how each participant actually performed. That's very difficult today because the smart contract for the protocol cannot even access the record of what each participant did. And more generally, we're very excited to explore applications in on-chain reputation and identity. Essentially, by looking at the complete record of a user's actions on-chain, we can assign perhaps a fee rebate, uh, perhaps better lending terms, or perhaps an NFT mint or airdrop based on what you actually did. So I think we're very early in exploring these applications already, but I want to turn the page to what would be the next level. Suppose this chicken grows up, is a mature chicken, done with reflection, and I want to say that the next step is something I'm calling introspection. And so what's introspection? 
Well, introspection is when you really think about yourself. And to me, that means transaction simulation, but in a verifiable way. And with a number of the ZK EVMs starting to come to market, I think we can start speculating on what that would bring to smart contract applications outside of a roll-up context. Um, so a few ideas that we've had are first something we're calling hypothetical property testing. Um, that's a lot of words, but let me give an example. Suppose you have a decentralized insurance protocol. So you try to buy insurance that some lending protocol was not going to rug pull you. And the core problem here is you need to prove to the insurance protocol that you actually lost your money. Well, in my mind, the highest standard for proof that you actually lost money is that if you can prove that when you try to withdraw, you don't get any money. So that's an operation that fundamentally involves transaction simulation and introspection. Another example would be an exploit marketplace. So if I'm a you know, white hat, gray hat hacker, and I want to prove that I found a vulnerability in some sort of DeFi protocol, again, the gold standard is if I can exhibit a sequence of transactions, which I can prove that when executed, result in me draining the protocol. So these things sound a bit crazy today, but I actually think that they're going to be within reach in the next one to two years. A few more examples include giving ZK-enabled versions of fraud or fault proofs for things that are currently done on optimistic rollups um, with the long withdrawal period. ZK might not be able to get to the synchronous setting, but it can certainly reduce these uh, withdrawal periods, again, by simulating the transactions run on the rollup. And finally, another direction to think about is if you're evaluating block builders uh, for whether they did certain actions pertaining to MEV, well, you probably want to consider whether there are alternative blocks they could have built which have better properties. And that is an operation which fundamentally involves provably simulating the results of those blocks. So I think we're very early in thinking about the possibilities here, um, but I just wanted to introduce this to the conversation. So I'll leave everyone with a little map of how I think about reflection and introspection in blockchains. So I think we can map our off-chain usage of archive nodes to reflection, our, and these enhanced archive nodes with tracing or transaction simulation to introspection. We're building something to handle reflection on-chain at Axiom, and I think we're very early on understanding what's going to happen with introspection on-chain. So that's it. Any questions for our speaker? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. A very clean mental model here. Um, can you talk more about the cost model between all the Merkle Patricia proof workloads? Um, because the thing that you're building obviously is very similar to the ZK EVM workload. And I assume that the number of constraints is going to be gigantic. And so how are you thinking about prover performance in this context? Yes, definitely. So in a ZK EVM, you actually have to do two operations. The first, which most people think is the hardest but is not, is to run the EVM as a VM. The second, which is much harder, is to actually prove that everything you accessed or wrote was done correctly. And so those workloads are very similar to what we're building for these trustless historic reads. Um, and if you look at Polygon or Mez or Scroll, they're actually replacing the Ethereum storage with a different version in order to make that more ZK friendly and get to market faster. So if you look at Vitalik's taxonomy, the type one ZK EVMs, which I think Polygon Zero is working on, as well as Tyco, don't have this feature. And as a consequence, they have a much more challenging problem. So I think the workloads between what we're building actually start to merge with what the ZK EVMs are doing. I also have a question regarding that. So, uh, do you think if you redesign ZK oh, EVM from the ground up, right, with ZK in mind, uh, so like you know, like you mentioned, there's on-chain data easily accessible synchronously, and then off-chain data uh, that's you know doesn't compose the on-chain data, right? Um, do, do you think like actually redesigning the entire thing could um, maybe 
you know, you have like data data regimes where like it's composed with with, with with each other, and and you know, like applications will live in live in there. Like maybe DeFi and like gaming will live in another. I don't know. I'm just like thinking out loud. Uh, th does that make sense? Yeah, def definitely. I, I think maybe what you're pointing to is that there's some notion of some type of state that you want to synchronously compose between, and and that's extremely expensive to do to offer synchronous composition over a set of data. And then there's other types of data access that you're OK being asynchronous over. For example, if you've already participated in a protocol and you're just waiting to get paid, you can wait 15 minutes. Um, I think so far in EVM, all access is of the former type because we haven't reached the scale where there's limitations. But I think, I think that we're going to get there pretty soon. And that's sort of the future we're building for.